Greetings, Zimbabwe, Africa, and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I'm in conversation with Dr. Agnes Mahomba, who is the Chief Coordinator to the National Response to COVID-19. Enjoy this informative conversation. <music> Dr. Mahomba, okay. welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. I am delighted to have you on the show, particularly knowing that you are busy running around on behalf of the nation to try and uh, get on top of uh, COVID-19. So welcome to the show and thank you so much for uh, being available. <laughs> Thank you so much, Trevor. It's a pleasure to be here and grateful that you could invite me because this is really part of the work that I need to do, ensure that we're informing the nation and others of what's happening uh, as it pertains to COVID-19 in Zimbabwe. So you, you've been in the hot seat, doctor, for, uh, since uh, May. Um, how is the hot seat? It's still very hot, and I'm sure it will remain hot for quite some time because there's a lot of work to do, as you are aware. This was a brand new position, just like the virus itself, uh, new to everybody. So there's a whole lot that just replaced the office itself, ensuring that we're clear in terms of what we need to do, and then try to move forward. So it is still very hot. Tell me about what how you received the news. When you got the news that President Nangagwa had appointed you uh, to be the chief coordinator for the national response against COVID-19. What went through your mind? It was a, a surprise. Uh, I was humbled uh, for him to put such confidence and trust in me for such a huge uh, a task. Uh, having learned from other places where, where it started in China, for example, uh, that people were struggling with managing it. And so there I was put in this particular position to, to coordinate it throughout the country. Very humbling, uh, but really honored uh, to be in it. Fantastic. Doctor, when uh, reading uh, through your bio and reading around, one gets the sense that life actually has prepared you for this position. Uh, that everything that you've done so far was as if somebody knew that one day you'll be uh, sitting on that hot seat. Doctor, you've got um, a Master's uh, uh, of Public Health from the University of Zimbabwe, which you passed with a distinction. You've got a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery. Uh, and then you've got an associate in science, which you passed again with a, with, a, with a distinction. So your academic grounding has prepared you for this task that you now are carrying on on behalf of the nation. I would say so indeed. Uh, I am confident with the qualifications that I have to be able to deliver in this particular task. But it's not just about the qualifications, Trevor. I feel some of the experiences that I've had, I went straight into managing HIV and AIDS uh, with the Minister of Health way back. And as you can see, back then it was also a new virus, which we didn't know much about. So the experiences that I got from really managing that, especially when I was running the a prevention of mother to child transmission where everybody had lots of doubts about we can never have the numbers that WHO is talking about when it comes to us being uh, defined as a, having eliminated mother to child transmission for example so the experiences I got in there the experiences that I got leading an international NGO running a HIV programming uh, here in Zimbabwe but also in the regional level and at the global level uh, those experiences that add to the qualifications that you're talking about. Mm. And part of uh, the experience, Doctor, was your serving uh, the city of Harare uh, a, a, as a, a clinical, clinical officer and assistant director for seven years. And you were in charge of uh, Wilkins and uh, Beatrice. Again, that is as if somebody uh, sent you an assignment and said, you need to do these things because one day they will become relevant in your career. Uh, very relevant. You know, God has got his ways of uh, putting uh, things in place. When I was indeed working at uh, Wilkins Hospital, Beatrice Hospital, we were 
we're talking of the other infectious diseases, the hepatitis and so on and so on. Of course, we never knew that there was going to be this COVID-19. Here it is, and, and the very same institutions have actually now turned out to be uh, two of our main institutions that we have prepared, continue to prepare to manage your COVID-19. So that experience, once again, really has helped me uh, to, to hit the ground running, if, as it were. Mm. Talk to me about the preparedness now of uh, Wilkins and the Beatrice uh, infection uh, hospitals. Are they in a, in a, in a, in a good co condition, uh, given what they've gone through in the past uh, six months or so? We love to continue adding on and improving on what is there, but just to take you back, when I was working there way back and just before COVID, those were just isolation facilities. They were isolating the hepatitis, the TBs, uh, HIVs, cases that purely needed isolation, but did not necessarily require any intensive care, i.e. ventilation and all that. COVID is very different. We are learning from other countries that those who are severe and critical uh, might need ICU. And hence, coming back to Wilkins and Beatrice, we have prepared them. Wilkins now is able to take patients and actually admit to ICU. We now have intensive care unit facilities at Wilkins, which we never had. Beatrice Hospital, we're still working on it, but they are now able, better able to isolate for COVID. Of course, we're still working on the ICU facilities, but we've come a long way. We are ready to manage the best way we can. We can never be 100% ready. And that's that just needs to be very clear to everybody out there that when we say we are prepared, it means we are in a better place. If we get a case that need ICU, we can manage it, uh, but we still need to do more because if we get large numbers, we can be challenged. Mm. Where are we right now, doctor, as far as the, the, the management of COVID is concerned? What are your biggest concerns? Are we flattening the curve or there's things that you, data is, is showing you that is worrying you? Where are we as far as controlling this pandemic is concerned? We're, we're not flattening the curve yet, uh, unfortunately, uh, and we are keeping an eye on it. We just yesterday, we were looking with our task force to say, okay, if we're looking at the uh, six criteria that WHO has uh, basically recommended for most to use as you try and figure out where you are with your response, whether you're trying to reopen your economy based on any lockdowns you might have uh, put in place, we quite clearly say transmission control is not quite where we want it. We continue having large numbers of returning residents, uh, and that's the biggest risk for ourselves in terms of our quarantine facilities, post of entry, those large numbers. And recently we're seeing uh, an increase in what we're calling local transmission. So we, we don't have that under control yet but we have made a lot of progress in terms of uh, preparing for it. And all the other parameters, we are very clear, we still have some hotspots that we could manage better. We're working on it. We're very clear that is, as, as far as the communities are concerned, when we had our initial lockdown, um, everybody was really on point, but now a lot of people seem to be a bit relaxed. Uh, not doing as much as they should. And so we are concerned about those things. So to really summarize your question, are we really prepared? Uh, we've made progress, but we are still not where we want to be. If anything, we're even more concerned because we begin to see people relax a little because as we're looking at the cases in Zimbabwe, a large percentage are people who have, who are positive, but are not critically ill. What's your biggest concern right now, as far as uh, your job is concerned? Where are the biggest challenges coming from, Doctor? The biggest concerns are that we, con we continue to struggle with testing. We need to know what the epidemic is all, all like in our communities. And as long as we are unable to test as much as we can, we'll continue having estimates, modeling, and so on, when we really should just be testing more so that it's much clearer in terms of what the transmission is like in our communities. And then we're able to fine tune our responses and so on. So that's really big number one, though a lot is being done in that area. 
I am also extremely concerned with the community response. Lots of work has been done in terms of informing the community, uh, trying to engage them. But unfortunately, where we are now, it appears everybody's relaxing. People don't seem to be taking it seriously. And everybody's looking for somebody else to do something. We are saying prevention is the utmost for this uh, kind of uh, pandemic prevention prevention and as long as people are not doing what they are supposed to be doing social distancing we've learned in some uh, funerals people are hugging uh, we're seeing people trying to now reconvene the huge uh, uh, church gatherings all those things are a big concern to me because prevention is the cornerstone. We can talk of preparing Wilkins for ICU, but by the time you get there, it's a tiny percentage of people who require that. A large percentage who have the virus get ill, not necessarily required to be in isolation in, in ICU. Hence, it is so important for people to uh, prevent, for us all to prevent. Those are my two main concerns, really. The testing, the communities, not perhaps changing their behavior soon enough. But then again, the experiences I, I got with HIV management, it make me feel a bit um, not too panicky as, as it were, because I know those are processes that we're going to go through. We just need to keep hammering, remain focused, and we'll get there, we will make it. What's the biggest challenge, Doctor, as far as testing is concerned? Our biggest challenge with testing, uh, initially, it was really the, the test kits themselves, They're not enough, and uh, we just joined the whole world where people are struggling to get the amounts that they needed to test as much as they could. And uh, remember, we have to import them, get them from everybody else. We are not manufacturing our own here. So we are not always prioritized, especially when we started, our epidemic looked like, oh, we just have a few cases. But unfortunately, that is the time when you don't have numbers to really quickly make sure your testing cap capabilities are up there and you're testing and you know what to do. So that is really a, a big challenge that we have seen ourselves with. And of course, coupled with the test kits themselves, the human resource factor for ourselves in Zimbabwe, you are aware, and this is not a secret to the world out there, we've continued to have challenges with our healthcare workers, nurses going on strike, uh, coming back, and so on and so on. So you might then have the kids there, who is going to test, who is going to take the samples. So we are really battling with that, but we never sit and just complain. We continue looking for innovative ways of doing things. We continue pushing and saying, if the communities working with ourselves together, a whole of government, a whole of society, we focus on the prevention, then we won't worry too much about the test kits. We won't worry too much about people who have to be admitted because we will have prevented it. Um, what are your targets, doctor, for testing on a daily basis? And are you able to, what's the gap between what you want to achieve uh, and the ideal? Well, that, that is a very interesting question. At one point, we used, uh, we have a team of scientists who helped us model and come up with the numbers to say by end of April in May, we should, we probably would have uh, just over a thousand cases. And in order for us to do, to identify all of those, we should be testing about 33 up to 40,000. Then we calculated our targets. When we started implementing that, oh boy, did we have challenges. The kids were not there. And so, so we're not, we, we don't want to dwell so much on those numbers anymore. We are simply saying, let's make sure we've got the kids. Once we have them, we run with testing with the available resources. So targeting, yes, we started on it, we put it in place, but the experience told us that, you know what, you can have all the numbers in a pretty document, but as long as we don't have them, we won't meet those targets. And so what we have done now is to prioritize the areas that we test. We get X number of kids. We're saying, where's the risk area? As we're speaking now, it's the borders, uh, entry points, returning residents, quarantine facilities. We're just hitting those and saying, we've got to prioritize those and ensure that we have our target is to make sure everybody's tested in line 
as you get to the border, you enter, you get your first test. Uh, we wait, we, we retest you at day eight, and we then, of course, test you again at discharge. That, I could say, is a rough target based on the resource that we have. Has um, the private sector come on board as far as testing is concerned, doctor? And if they have, has there been any difference at all? Absolutely, and thank you for bringing that up. I want to, to say thank you so much to the private sector. We've got one particular large laboratory here in Harare. I won't mention their name. I don't know if I'm able to Oh, you're uh, absolutely allowed to do go it. Ahead. Please go ahead and mention them. <laughs> okay, mention them. Lancet Laboratory, Lancet Laboratory, for example, have really come on board properly uh, and not like a lab which wants to just do a quick back and so on. They have their systems in place. They've even gone on to ensure that they also have a rapid response teams that are allowing those in the private sector to be tested. And of course, they are immediately linking with Minister of Health and Child Care to make sure that their results are recorded to make sure that any additional follow-up of contacts and so on, it is within the public health context approach in line with the uh, Public Health Act. So they are helping us a lot. They have tested so many. I don't have the number now, the latest, but they are. They have really stepped up and were truly grateful to a point where even the public sector, we've actually called upon when we have challenges of test kits and say, okay, can you step in and do this test in this quarantine facility? for example. Oh, that's very good to hear. What about the cost, uh, Doctor? You are happy with what the private sector is charging for, for the testing? It all depends. Uh, the, 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 the example I've given, I think they're being very reasonable. They're just trying to really make sure that the costs are cover what is required. You know, this is an expensive business. And so they're doing just that. I will not be able to speak for everybody else in the private sector. For examples like Lancet, we're quite happy. They're really stepping up. Uh, of course, here and there, we, we do have uh, a few labs, challenging labs that want to do their own thing. But of course, this is where we also step up and try and ensure that uh, the law is enforced, that people are not just doing whatever they want, because this is a, a public health emergency, uh, a, a disaster for us, and indeed we need to stick with the Public Health Act uh, in terms of how we manage infectious diseases so that we are able to control it well. Mm. Are you happy with um, our isolation and quarantine uh, centers in terms of the hygiene? Uh, and, and, and all the facilities that are out there in the isolation centers and quarantine centers? Happy is not a word I would use. I can say we have some challenges there, uh, which don't make me very happy. Uh, but again, as I've always said, when we have challenges, we go in and try and see what exactly is happening, what is the challenge, uh, what is it that we need to do. So for example, when we started, we had such large crowds coming in from our border, South Africa being example, a base bridge, for example, and we really literally ran out of uh, space uh, to quarantine those who were returning. And we had to run around, identify schools to use them. And because they were never designed to be quarantine facilities, we, we then started having challenges, some of which you're mentioning. When we identified the challenges, we realized we need to urgently put in place SOPs uh, that help us uh, guidelines to manage those efficiently, effectively. I'm happy to say we ran with that. They're in place. We then moved on to uh, train uh, healthcare workers. The quarantine facilities are managed by uh, Labor and Social Welfare Ministry with Minister of Health and Law Enforcement. Those are the three subcommittees of a task force that are responsible for that. And so we trained, but as you know, you can train all you like. You also need to have the, the right quantities of the human resource to manage. As I just pointed earlier, we're struggling with our, our nurses being on strike. Those are some of the people who need to be in those quarantine facilities, ensuring that that hygiene you're talking about, infection and prevention and control measures are in place, and so on. So we continue working to improve, but some of the challenges that we have make it quite difficult to resolve them in, in the timelines that we want. But that never uh, puts a, um, uh, makes us uh, feel defeated because we're not, we continue to focus. Mm. And uh, related to that uh, issue, Doctor, is contact tracing. Do we have capacity for uh, yes. contact tracing? How much contact tracing are we, are we, are we doing? 
we're seeing reports uh, of people running away from the quarantine or isolation centers, which raises the question, are we doing enough of contact tracing? In terms of people running away, as I indicated earlier on, you come in, you're supposed to be tested at day one, and then you, you have a repeat PCR uh, day eight, and so on. So some of the delays that we had, because we had run out of kids or something like that, quite clearly then made some of those uh, uh, residents in our quarantine facilities feel a bit nervous, wanting to just leave before they are tested, and so on. So we've re-looked and once again, as I say, we're prioritizing the quarantine facilities as it comes to testing so that we're able to discharge people on time and hence the delays in us uh, being able to test in communities that I, com uh, I talk to as a challenge to say we really need to know what's happening in the community. But as long as we have challenges with our testing, we have prioritized testing in certain risk areas quarantines, entry points, those are some of the places that we have done. So really those challenges we continue having on and off, but I want to assure our, our viewers and the Zimbabwe's at large that a lot, every effort is being made to address those issues. And yes, we don't have, we don't always have enough people to do contact tracing. Just yesterday, we said to re-strategize and say, here we are, with some of our nurses are, are, are not on duty. What is it that we need to do? We're talking of coming in and, and hiring uh, temp uh, people to come in and join our rapid response teams so that we are uh, responding and contact tracing in a timely fashion. We re-emphasize to our teams that we want to follow the WHO 24-hour, 24-hour approach. In other words, you suspect a case within 24 hours, it must be tested. You have tested them within 24 hours, that result must be there. You you know they are, they are positive, you know their contacts. 24 hours, you must run around and contact trace so that you test them as well. That was just yesterday as we were emphasizing to say, yes, we have a challenge with the rapid response teams. We don't have enough uh, of the numbers, uh, but we need to be innovative and still move with contact tracing. So to answer your question, I'm not too happy uh, because we do have challenges, but we are doing something about the challenges. Um, the, the Moving now to the issue of... Uh, uh, you've already spoken about the uh, conditions of uh, the, the rather the nurses and the doctors nurses not being there sometimes and then presenting uh, challenges for you because they are they are protesting that they're not being paid properly and we've seen uh, dr Mar Wright, the, uh, the 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 infections uh, for uh, frontline workers because they don't have enough uh, personal protective uh, equipment is that an issue that concerns you or uh, uh, i got it wrong there Anytime we get our healthcare worker being infected, that's a huge, big concern for me. We don't want to even see that. We have since jumped into the Blawayo community is one that was affected mostly. I'm talking of our healthcare community. And we've since jumped in to say what is happening, what was not happening. We do have challenges with PPE. But some of the issues that are very similar to what we're seeing in our communities at large as well, out there, not just in the hospitals, are the complacency of our healthcare workers and indeed the communities at large. And we're saying, look, you need to be uh, vigilant. Remember before COVID came, every healthcare worker knows if you're going into a hospital, working into a um, healthcare facility, you treat everybody as if they have a horrible infection that you can catch. Okay. And so you must do all the infection prevention control measures that you were trained at nursing school, medical school, and so on. If you don't have it, don't compromise. So we're working on one, uh, uh, availing PPE, but two, making sure that the attitudes of our healthcare workers are in line with what they have been trained to do. We are also having challenges of having um, small numbers of uh, PPE, but our teams also then perhaps not using them appropriately. You don't need to wear a Tyvek suit from top to bottom, everything, a, a spaceship type um, uh, PPE to, to be able to take temperature and check someone's um, uh, 
uh, as symptoms at the entrance or at the gate, for example. You do need your mask, certain needs, but when you're going into ICU, for example, you need the full gear. So this is where we were also having challenges where this the little amounts that we have were not being used appropriately. We've since tightened up on that one so that when we do need the specific PPE for specific occasions, it is available. You don't need to have lots and lots of it, but the little that we have must be used appropriately. So those are the challenges that we have. It's not just about the quantities, how it's used, the attitude of those who are using it, and what we are doing as a government to encourage people to be efficient, effective, and utilize the resources uh, uh, in, in an efficient way so that we are able to uh, overcome this challenge. Mm. As, as we sit here, Doctor, do you think uh, the worst is yet to come as far as the pandemic is concerned? I definitely cannot say that, uh, Trevor, because as you asked me at the very beginning, are we flattening the curve? I said not yet. Our numbers are actually going up. We're very clear on that one. We have analyzed, we've looked at it, and we are not where we think, oh, we're flattening, oh, it's now going to go down. And hence, we are bracing ourselves. We have always braced ourselves for the worst. And we are saying we are grateful for having uh, had this opportunity of preparing. The lockdown gave us some more time to prepare, to put in place uh, things that need to be in place. We talked of the Wilkins, which is now able to admit uh, for ICU, for example, and a whole lot of other things that we didn't have in place that are now in place. So when we pick and we have large numbers that might need to be admitted, we hope and we are preparing to be ready, but we cannot say we're at that peak yet. And this is one of the reasons why I am saying communities out there, let's step up, let's ensure we're preventing because we don't want to find ourselves with our health system that was already challenged before COVID, struggling because we have not done the responsible way of preventing at community level, at facility level, and so that whatever numbers we then get, we're able to manage them without any problems whatsoever. I'm confident we'll get there. So the, what does the worst look like uh, for you, doctor? I mean, we are now at a point where uh, we're reaching a thousand. Uh, and uh, what's your modeling telling you going forward in terms of what that, that worst is going to look like? You know, availability of beds, infection levels, and so forth. What will that worst uh, kind of scenario look like? The worst case scenario that we are planning for, we are hoping we'll never have, is where we will have large numbers of positive cases requiring uh, ICU. Uh, high dependency unit management, uh, where the number of facilities that we have, the Wilkins uh, and St. Anne's, by the way, which is a private facility, a hospital has come on board, uh, and all the other facilities in, in our provinces are unable to manage those uh, cases. This is why we're saying uh, our modeling numbers from WHO, from our local teams, have indicated that we have these large numbers that our facilities won't be able to manage. But this is modeling. Mm. And this is why we are pushing for the prevention so that we will not get those numbers that require ICU. Mm. And this is where we are, we, that's where my concern is to say, communities out there, hear us out. We don't want those large numbers that require ICU. We have seen rich countries which have so much I see you struggling, basically digging uh, mass graves for their people because they have not been able to manage those severe cases. So I can't give you the numbers because as we started modeling, we thought it would be peaking end of July, August, but that has been that curve has been pushed uh, a little bit further down. I was sitting with our modelers the other day, and they're actually looking at the, that being pushed a little further down. Maybe it'll come uh, August, September. This is modeling. Mm. We are looking at the reality on the ground. What do we have? Mm. We're grateful that the majority of the cases that we have seen as Zimbabwe have not been critically ill. And hence, as we are now re-putting data in these model, models that we use, the numbers of those positives or the requiring critical care are much less. 
but we still continue to work with our scientists to to understand it better but we can never know exactly what's going to happen believe you me even who initially they thought africa you'll be hit so hard papers are now coming out telling us actually maybe the epidemic in africa is a uh, uh, minor south africa is a bit attenuated we have our own science who, scientists who did some um, uh, analysis of our data and they've told us oh it's it probably not as bad but we don't like that message out there because that's one of those messages that then make people relax so the message i put across is we don't know what's going to happen with this new disease but we are ready to tackle any challenge we are ready to use the numbers the statistics that we have to guide us as we move forward that's our science so clearly, uh, Doctor, I agree with you that uh, there needs to be behavioral changes um, because when you drive around uh, uh, or, or just observe, there is a sense that there is uh, some form of lockdown fatigue. What message do you have for the communities, uh, Doctor Mahomva? Uh, a crisp, clear message. What do you want the communities to do? A crisp, clear message is for the communities to look at themselves and say, I need to do something. I should not wait for government, for everybody else. They definitely should continue holding us in our government positions accountable for the things we need to do. They must continue asking their questions and really demanding from us. But at the end of the day, when we look at the communities out there, including people in quarantine facilities, my message to them is, please, you need to do something yourself. We learned in Mashona and East, for example, in some of the quarantine facilities, that there are some returning residents who are more interested in getting condoms. They were saying, whoa. You can't do that. Where's the social distancing? How are you taking care of yourself? The quarantine facility might not be exactly what you wanted, but stay in your corner. Don't mingle. Do what you need to do as you the individual, as you the community. Is that a prevention that I really would like our communities, our families to take more seriously. And hence we are looking at it, working with our uh, communi risk communication subcommittee of the task force, risk communication pillar of the Ministry of Health. What is it that we need to do to get our message out there a bit more clear, clear more clear? The same experiences that we got when we started HIV, people were just not serious but later on they became serious about it. We're sincerely hoping we'll get there with our communities sooner and not later. Mm. The, the other issue that concerns a lot of people, Doctor, is um, uh, when kids go back to school, uh, whether they indeed should, they, should schools reopen. And I saw something uh, yesterday from the Center of Disease Control that says it's actually much more damaging to keep the kids at home uh, as compared to sending them out to school. Do you take a view on that? Absolutely. We've been discussing this just yesterday. I was even asked on our own ZBC at the end of our task force meeting about schools opening. The idea and UNICEF that we work with, that they, are, they, they have children at heart, they have done all the uh, literature review, some of the issues that you're bringing up, feeding in to uh, supporting us to make sure that we're better informed in terms of what's coming out elsewhere. And we have taken the position that we just need to prepare. We opened up for exams and we, when that um, decision was made to say, let's open up so that uh, exam school uh, classrooms can come and take exams, we specifically said, we want to learn from that process so that as we're coming out of the exam classrooms uh, going back and writing the exams we're taking the lessons the challenges whatever and applying them to and and, and strengthen our plan for reopening we also worked as a chief coordinator i made sure that i was working with the minister of 
primary and secondary education to ensure that their guidelines are in place, they have been reviewed, have they done consultations, and I'm really happy with what they have done in terms of consulting, consulting. And we're now saying, we do need to reopen. Let's make sure we're saying it's not business as usual. We're opening into a new normal. And hence, you could say, we are opening, but we're not opening. Because I think sometimes people confuse opening and thinking we're just going to do what we were doing before. Not at all. When we do reopen, our timelines are still very much set. It's a new normal where we do things very differently. And those guys, teachers are being trained. We've identified focal persons. All that is in place. What concerns me, as I said before, is the communities because the schools don't operate in isolation. It's the communities around them that also need to step up. If government has put in place all these strategies, SOPs, uh, guidance, and they have trained, and, and everything is in place for the new normal for opening schools, the communities around need to take these things seriously as well. So I, can, I agree with what they're saying. There is more damage to those uh, learners if we continue not getting them back where they need to. And not only that, we also have learned from science that the young ones are actually not as affected, uh, affected by this disease. Is the people out back in the, in, in the families, the elderly and so on. So what is it that we need to do to ensure that people are understanding the balance and that we are not, not disadvantaging our learners by putting them in harm's way or by also putting them in a different harm's way when we don't allow them to learn so that they are able to protect themselves as well. That balancing act will always be there. But as a government, we're very, very clear in terms of what we need to do. Um, I mean, the um, projections, doctor, are that uh, a vaccine is only going to be available around about January uh, 2021, which makes uh, your message around change your behavior, sanitize, uh, uh, physical distancing and that kind, kind of stuff is very important. It appears the critical issue, uh, Dr. Mahomva, is going to be communication. Do we have a plan around that? We do have, and thank you for asking that one. As I, I said earlier, we're working flat out to with the risk communication a subcommittee and the risk of the task force as well as the risk communication of the Minister of Health uh, specific plan. And the, those two working together uh, under the umbrella of the task force have indeed put in place a strategy and plans for that. This is where I said we are revisiting that strategy that is in place to say, yes, we have informed quite a lot. Uh, UNICEF did do an assessment where they actually said over 80% know about COVID and so on, but it's not good enough. And from the experience that I've had from HIV, it's more information, but changing the behavior. You can know everything, but still do nothing. Mm -hmm. We learned that even with the smoking, people know it will damage your lungs, but they still smoke anyway. So it's really, re-looking really at our strategic plan on commun risk communication and saying, what what else can we do? And part of that that we're doing is engaging the communities. They have to be meaningfully engaged so that they take ownership and they are beginning to work with their community leaders, uh, the sabukus and so on, to really help every community, every family appreciate that it's prevention, it's you changing your behavior, it's us getting into a new normal if we really want to make sure we're on top of this issue. And of course, continuously reminding ourselves of where we came from when we were managing HIV. Those are lessons that the communities appreciate and know. So in many ways, this is a blessing in disguise. Others might not have that experience here in Zimbabwe. We've got that experience. We're still managing large, over 1.4 million people with HIV, a, a large percentage live uh, on antiretroviral uh, treatment. And so those experiences uh, that the communities have now embraced, we're trying to tap into so that we can use them to also say this applies to COVID-19. Let's work together, change our behaviors, and we will succeed. Mm. There, there are certain places, uh, Dr. Mahomvo, where 
it is going to be difficult to social distance. Places like uh, our, our citizens who live in, in Bari, for instance, and in Makokoba, um, are, the, are you not worried about community outbreaks in those, in those crowded areas, in, in Bari Musika, for instance? Uh, worry, I don't know if I'll use that word. Concerned, absolutely. Worry will give me high blood pressure when I don't need it. I need to continue working. Yes. <laughs> Concerned, absolutely. But this is where we say, again, there are certain um, guidance that is given out there. Social distance, do this and so on. But we take it in the context. And this is where, as Zimbabwe we're saying, let's push a package. Mm. Social distance, yes. But remember, we, we also introduced the, the law of mandatory wearing of masks. That in itself also complements. So you can't quite social distance, but please wear your mask. Mm. You are on a combi, in a combi, in a, on a bus. Please make sure you're wearing your mask because it helps. So it's a combination. If you take things in isolation, then we will never succeed. Social distancing, absolutely, where it works. If you can't do it, uh, are you doing all those other things? Do you have your mask on? Are you washing your hands with soap and water? Are you avoiding other crowds? Things like that. So taking that package and implementing it as a package it helps where we now have gaps. So concerned, absolutely. That's our community. That's why we call them high density areas. They are high density. We step into to ensure that we're encouraging to do all other things that they need to do. Uh, given the issue that we've just been talking about, you know, the slowness in changing behavior, would a, a hard lockdown be the way out, Doctor? The hard lockdown we had at the end of March held us a lot put in place. Remember, it's really to when you have that, you're trying to put in place strategies and, and prepare and so on, so that, and you're also trying to push that curve a further down as you give yourself time to do that and so on. We've done that. Uh, another lockdown might help, and this, these are the dilemmas we now have. Remember, when you are introducing these public health and social measures that uh, can be defined as lockdowns. They benefit up to a point, but if you continue and sustain them for a very long time, they have some huge adverse effects. And those huge adverse effects also have effects on our health, not necessarily COVID directly. So if people now can't get food because it just hasn't been mobility, they might die of hunger, they might die of this. So balancing the act is where we are now and we're grappling with it we will not even mince our words about it but we're carefully analyzing our data to then make a plan in terms of how do we move from here but acknowledging that lockdown held us sustained sustained measures of that kind of approach uh, might also have those adverse effects. So what is it that we need to do to mitigate, to ensure that we then don't have double jeopardy? Mm. Your office, I, I take it, uh, Doctor, is uh, the central uh, focus point for coordinating uh, uh, help that is coming in from our international development partners. How is that going? It is indeed, but just to take you back a little, when this uh, uh, pandemic was declared a national disaster by His Excellency, uh, we already had uh, our uh, preparedness response plan launched by His Excellency. We were running with implementation at that time. I was with Minister of Health and Child Care. We had our partners uh, coming on board. Then the, His Excellency declared it a disaster. He put in place a task force to really uh, coordinate and run with it. And at the same time, you also then realize uh, we need perhaps a, a national coordinator. Then he rubbed me in. So working with those various uh, platforms in a whole of government, a whole of society is what I'm doing. Whole of government means working with the task force, the working party of the permanent secretaries that feed into that one, working with our command center. Whole of society means also those other players are very, very, very uh, supportive partners coming on 
board. And I have already reached out. We, we have organized our updates and discussion uh, calls with them. Just this morning, we had uh, one with the heads of agencies. Last week, we had one with the level higher to understand from them what is it that we are doing that they can enhance? What are some of the gaps that we might not have seen that they are seeing? How can they be better engaged so that they don't feel left out when government is just doing its own thing? We're not. A large percentage of the resources that are coming in are quite clearly coming from our partners. And hence that coordination from this office, from the other platforms I've mentioned, comes in. So I'm happy to say we're making progress. We still have lots to do, lots to do. Today's meeting, for example, really opened up my eyes in a number of areas that I had actually not thought about. But it's that dialogue, those communications that we have, and we continue working together. So we're truly grateful for the partners that have come on board technical we're truly grateful the partners have come on board in terms of donors uh, they are very willing to work with us they do have their concerns for example what's happening in health we are seeing a lot of strikes and us giving them updates continuously so that they appreciate that there is a challenge there's a gap but what is it that we are doing? How can they come on board? What is it that we can do together? That is indeed part of that coordination. Mm. And, and part of that coordination is some transparency, doctor, around the donations mm -hmm. that are coming from the international yes. partners. Are you getting uh, any concern being uh, uh, voiced by uh, the development partners as far as that is concerned? Uh, that one will always be a voice by our partners. I think our donors always express that. And uh, again, once again, experiences that I have from HIV and AIDS, where there were huge sums of money, the PEP funds, the global funds coming in, they always are nervous. Uh, our donors, is this money going to be used appropriately or not? It's up to us as government to demonstrate that we are. And in fact, uh, the, uh, the day last week when I had this uh, Zoom call with them, we assured them we had another call where, which was chaired by another ministry where we are now actually saying we, we are at an advanced stage in terms of uh, working with the World Bank, for example, developing a tracking system for resources that are coming in. And you know, the president himself has said, it doesn't matter what kind of donation, small, large, is continuously receiving people at State House, thanking them for the donations. But at the same time, it's not just about thanking them, making sure that everybody is clear about what we are receiving at national and provincial level, so that if there are gaps, if someone comes with something uh, and people don't know where it went, they can track and find out what happened. We saw you receiving this. We don't know what happened to it. So I am so delighted that at that highest level, our president has realized we need that transparency. Hence, how can I make sure that people are realizing that, that no matter how small the donation, how big it is, he's receiving it. It's documented. It's aired on our, 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 our news so that people see and they can then also track. But in addition to that, at the technical level, as I said, we're also having this tracking mechanism to ensure that we can really be as transparent as, as possible. In the meantime, while we're finalizing that, uh, our resource mobilization uh, subcommittee of the task force has made it their point to also publish in the newspapers of the donations, the donations as they come. So that once again, if there's a donation that you saw published and you don't quite know where it went, how it was utilized, the public can ask. So we also continue to ask our very partners what else can we do? How can they come on board to support us be as transparent as possible? But to answer your question in a very simplified way, absolutely, our donors are always concerned about transparency issues. If you are donating some money, you will always be concerned. You want to know what happened to that money I gave you. Did, was it used for the right things? That's normal. So we work with that and try our best to make sure we're as transparent as we can. Tell me now, doctor, what is it that we've gotten right and what is it that you've gotten terribly wrong over the past six months as far as COVID is concerned? What we've gotten right is acknowledging that this is a whole of government, a whole of society uh, response that is required. And so we have all the players on board trying to work together 
The big challenge though is this is not an easy task to make a whole of government, whole of society, my goodness. There are times when you feel like, oh my goodness, are we making progress or not? Because everybody has their own opinion. And, but you can never always take everything on board. You have to balance the act, weigh and so on. This is a fantastic idea, but you don't know some of the challenges that I know. Hence, we will include it in that, this fashion and we keep moving. That is, to me, a, one of the challenges, but I want to emphasize the whole of government, whole of society, it's just what you need for something this huge. There is no way government can do it alone. Specifically, there's no way Minister of Health can do it alone just because this is a health issue. It's a whole of government. It's a whole of society, and we need to move with it. That is a best practice. We're struggling with it. I cannot think there's a nation which will ever say if they do it that approach, it will be so easy. No ways, no ways. And so the flip coin is perhaps the biggest challenge, making it work uh, as we move forward as a whole of government, a whole of society. But we'll what, never what, do it differently. What have you gotten wrong? What have you gotten terribly wrong? What have we gotten it terribly wrong? Mm. Hey, that's a, a hard one. There are so many <laughs> things that we... Who, there are so many things that we didn't know that we didn't do correctly. Mm. Uh, to just say one will be difficult to say, but I have to say the big challenge, I don't know if we could say we did it wrongly, we just didn't know, especially managing our post of entry uh -huh. and our quarantine facilities. That is the biggest risk that we have as we speak we have struggled with it initially when we started perhaps we got it wrong by not realizing not actually thinking we'll have the large numbers of people coming back home there we got it wrong in terms of our uh, uh, estimates or uh, uh, the calculations if you like and hence we then found ourselves just huge numbers literally flooding and we're now running to try and put in place things we could have put in place earlier. When we knew this thing was coming with experiences from China, Italy and so on, and we saw what was happening in their health facilities, we got it right by beginning to prepare, prepare facilities and so on. That was the experience. We didn't have the experience of knowing that we'll have floods of people coming back mm. at the same time. And hence, we were a little bit slow in preparing for that. But I'm happy to say, as I said, we acknowledge our gaps and challenges. We know that's our biggest risk, and we're working flat out on that, including enhancing our security at the border, the porous borders. Yes, that's the biggest challenge. Uh, porous borders, ensuring that we have guidelines for quarantine management, uh, working flat out to, as a whole of government, um, uh, law enforcement, labor and social welfare, Ministry of Health, to strengthen that weak link that we have noticed, which happens to also be our biggest risk. Mm. I know you said you don't want to be positive because that uh, makes people relax and think that uh, this thing is not as bad as it should be. But as a scientist, how do you explain the fact that the numbers have not been as bad as CDC or the WHO thought would be, that Africa has not been hit as hard as Italy, Spain, and America? How do you explain that, Doctor? That one, Trevor, is a big subject for research, and our, uh, our scientists are looking at it. But I like to look at it in a very positive way and say, you know what, we, we learned, and we began to start preparing and putting in place measures, and so our numbers, which we thought would increase, rise, and peak at an earlier age, uh, stage, have moved on, with they're now beginning to go up rapidly, and so on. So there's something good we've also been doing. There's nothing wrong with us saying that. We have done a number of things very well, I might add, and for Zimbabwe specifically, we have been locked down, logged out, uh, because of uh, our political issues and so on and so on. We were already not receiving those huge numbers of uh, planes landing in Zimbabwe uh, at our international airports, unlike South Africa, for example. So in many, many ways for us as Zimbabwe, that, that, that was a blessing in disguise. We already had some form of lockdown uh, that allowed us to then quickly move a little bit faster than others uh, that, that had to really address that challenge. That to me is one way of looking at 
a negative and looking at the positive and maximizing on it. Mm. There's nothing wrong with it. So our numbers haven't gone up because we didn't have those huge influx of people coming into Zimbabwe from those very countries that had such large numbers uh, because of our situation. And so we took advantage and began to prepare appropriately. Mm. That to me is one of the reasons. Uh, but at the end of the day, scientifically, I can't say mm. this is new. We are learning, uh, and as the scientists look at it, we sincerely hope sooner than later they'll tell us why the case is the way it is. But of course, as I said in the beginning, we continue to prepare for the worst. After all, who knows? We might say, oh, they're lower, when in fact they're going to shoot up more than anywhere else much, much later. So we don't even want to lose sight of that possibility. We continue to prepare with the worst case scenario. What if I push back, Dr. and say that the numbers are not high because you're not testing enough? It, it is a, a possibility, and we've never run away from that. As I said, at the beginning when you asked me, I said that is our, our pain point. We want to test as much as we can, but we're not able to. But remember, we're also looking, we had, we analyzed some of our data, looking at the mortalities last year, the same period, and looking at the mortalities this year, the same period, and we didn't see a, a difference at all. That says something to us to say, well, if we're not getting, if we're getting those large numbers in the communities and they're dying, we would see the mortality peak up even though we haven't tested anyone we're not seeing anything like that at all so that is good that is positive it means no it's not as high as we, it would otherwise we'd see that the other thing is to say yes we might have large numbers in the communities and we haven't identified them we haven't because we haven't tested but they are mild because they would be dying if they were not mild, the critical, severe, would then see our mortality shooting up when we compare this period and last year. They are not, which means if we, there are numbers out there, they're mild. Thank God for that. If people are recovering, they have it, they're recovering, maybe that's good. We, it's not good we have it, but it's good that we are, we are not having people dying. Remember, uh, maybe I shouldn't say remember, uh, our, our purpose for this uh, response is really to minimize the impact uh, on the health of our people as we're looking at morbidity and mortality. We don't want people to be ill of COVID and we don't want people to die. And so what we are seeing with the small numbers means just that. Whether we have tested or not, we really would love to test more. But as long as the numbers, if they're out there and they are not sick to be admitted, they are not sick and going on to die, that, that aim, that goal of ours is being satisfied. Fantastic. That's, that's a very hopeful note there, right, Doctor? Um, you are a, a mother. Uh, you are, if you have acknowledged, you have this high pressure job. Um, uh, how do you balance uh, uh, being a mother and being uh, the national coordinator uh, of uh, this, 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 this pandemic? Is there work life balance for you, Doctor? There's work-life balance for me and my husband. Our children are adults now, doing their own thing. So <laughs> I don't have little ones where I have to worry. I have to rush back home to whatever. And my 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 husband is also one of those who is so dedicated to making a, a big difference in his community, works very hard. So we compare notes in terms of how we're working uh, and have a good laugh together in the evenings uh, to say, okay, uh, what's putting you down, what's happening, and we, uh, we relax and just enjoy life in that uh, aspect. I think we have worked hard from day one as a couple and we cannot see it differently. Mm -hmm. Um, do, the, do you have books, uh, Dr. Mahomva, that you have read that you would want to recommend to our viewers who love uh, to get uh, book recommendations to influential people such as yourself? Uh, I have recently been looking at my life mm. and thinking, hmm, what is it that I have done? 
how can I uh, put myself out there to continue also inspire some young young ones as they come in their careers so that people are not always negative. And hence, as a result of that, I decided to look at people who've written books about themselves, what they have done. And the latest that I was reading is the, the one that um, uh, Michelle Obama wrote on herself. Right. Right. I have admired her as a strong lawyer, the work she did in her home uh, town, and moving on and help balancing the act of realizing that there's a public life out there but you never forget about your family and at the same time you should not forget that you're a professional you can do a whole lot so I've read that book and it was truly inspiring it actually encouraged me to say okay I'm not I'm not doing anything so wrong here I can continue working hard uh, but uh, being reminded by her becoming mm. Mm. Uh, book that it, it can be done. Uh, we just need to remain focused and appreciate what uh, 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 others uh, are encouraging us to do. Mm -hmm. So that's one that mm, I yes. looked at. Yes. Yes. I've also uh, looked and uh, looked at there's this gentleman uh, who was uh, our Prime Minister, Atam Tambara. Uh -huh. uh, he's written two books. I've read the first one. I'm trying to read the second one. Again, for the very same reason I said, I like to see those who seem to be in challenging positions, what they have done, how, and interesting for this particular one, I have actually picked it up because I happen to know him. He went to the same primary school that I went. And I said, hmm, I wonder if there's something to pick up from there. Yeah. And that's it main reason really that I've done that. So in the books that I've actually been reading are to do with something like that, to say, at this age in my life, uh, what can I really do to enhance or to really also encourage others to continue working as hard as they can, if they can? Mm, fantastic. Doctor, your parting shot, what are the last words that you want to say to Zimbabweans uh, at this particular moment who are anxious about uh, the pandemic, uh, who feel uneasy about the pandemic, their families and they you know losing jobs and so forth. What are your parting shots to Zimbabweans? First of all, they should not panic. I've always said we knew the numbers were going to go up. It was a question of when. Uh, we are preparing as hard as we can, as I pointed out uh, earlier. It is up to every single one of us to do something, not to wait for somebody to do it for us. If we are looking at prevention, 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 and doing all those things we have been telling everybody to do, social distancing, washing your hands, wearing your mask. I don't have mine here because I'm talking to you, to my computer, but it's right here on the side. Those are the things that we want our communities to do. It is, it is really essential that we change our behaviors to embrace the new normal uh, because we don't have the huge resources that others have. Let's ensure that the prevention aspect is much stronger. Then we don't have to use our resources to buy fancy things uh, and so on. Doctor, thank you so much. I mean, I know you are very busy as the, the chief coordinator for the national response uh, against uh, COVID. Thank you so much. We wish you all the best in your, in your role, and we pray that uh, we never see uh, the worst of, uh, of, 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 of this uh, pan pandemic. So we wish you all the best. If you could remain there, doctor, and allow me to address myself now to our viewers who are in Zimbabwe, on the continent, and in the diaspora, to say to them, thank you so much for watching In Conversation, which is a weekly show. And to ensure that you don't miss out on these amazing quality conversations, please click on this red subscribe button here so that you get notification every time we have a new program. So thank you so much. Until next time, cheers to you all.